pace a little bit. So what I'm going to do is for these last two classes, there's not going to be very much opportunity to get participation marks. So I'm going to try to move a bit more quickly so that I'm going to give a participation mark to everyone who's here for these last two classes. Okay, so you get a mark just by being here because I'm not going to give you an opportunity to participate as much. Okay, so I have some questions about the exam. Okay, so I received a question by email, and the question is that different instructors sometimes have different expectations when answering fact patterns. So the question was, um, should you give the statements of the legal principles and be as comprehensive as possible, or should you just narrow in on the very specific legal principles that are triggered by the facts? Okay, so my preference is towards the latter. So in other words, if you, like let's say it's an issue of co-ownership, that's what we're going to be talking about today, and you see that on the exam, oh here's a co-ownership question, do not just start writing down every legal principle that you can remember <laughs> about co-ownership. Mm -hmm. Okay, that will get you like literally zero marks. The reason for that is because this is an open book exam, right? So it's easy to write down all the principles that there are about ownership because you can just copy them from your notes, right? So I can't give you marks for that. The marks come from the analysis. And more specifically, you've probably seen this before if you've taken other common law courses already, and maybe this is even the same with civil law. But the sort of formula that people often give is called IRAC. Okay, so I mean, is this familiar? Mm -hmm. yes. Okay, great. Okay. So most of the marks come from this step right here. Okay, so most of the marks come from identifying how the applicable legal rules and principles apply to the given facts, and in particular, giving an analysis that is nuanced. So in other words, looking to see if there are arguments on both sides. There aren't always arguments on both sides. Sometimes it's straightforward, but I try to come up with issues that aren't just totally um, straightforward, right? Because otherwise, there isn't going to be, it's going to be too simple. There has to be some nuance to it. So try to look to see if you can articulate an argument on both sides of any given issue. And then coming to a conclusion. So the conclusion is, what are the rights of the parties in that scenario, right? So what are they entitled to do in a concrete way? Like, what exactly are they entitled to do? Okay. So, any other questions about using this for the exam? I do. Okay, great. So, so uh, sorry, um, when you ask our, us a question, so essentially we're supposed to just identify what is the issue, the circumstance that's in question. Yeah, so always start by looking for issues, exactly. Okay. And there won't just be one issue per fact scenario. There's usually going to be more than one issue. And often there are sub-issues, right? So in other words, there are issues that are part of a larger issue. And so you don't need to always apply these steps in this order. You don't have to do this in a mechanical way. Sometimes you can mix up the order and that's fine and I'll understand what you're doing even if you don't do it in exactly this order. And sometimes instead of going, you know, issue rule and else conclusion over and over again, it might be sub-issue rule, sub-issue rule, sub-issue rule, then an analysis that covers all of them, right? So it's not mechanical, but just keep these steps in mind and make sure that you're covering these kinds of topics in your answer. Okay, so what we were talking about last week was co-ownership. And we saw that there are two main kinds of co-ownership in the common law. On one hand, we have joint tenants. And the characteristics of a joint tenancy are first the right of survivorship, which means that if we were to speak colloquially, that the interest of one joint tenant when they die automatically goes to the other joint tenant. 
The other key characteristic is that the four unities must be present in a joint tenancy. And we contrasted that with tenants in common, where the right of survivorship does not apply, and where the four unities could be present, but the, only the fourth one must be present. Okay, so the fourth one applies to both types of ownership. Okay, so the part that we were talking about at the end of the last class was a severance of a joint tenancy. And we saw that a severance just means turning a joint tenancy into a tenancy in common. And because the key uh, characteristic of a joint tenancy is the right of survivorship, the significance of a severance is that it ends the right of survivorship. And we saw that there are three ways to do this. The first applies at common law, and we looked at a bunch of different examples on the board of how to do that. Essentially, the first method at common law just means that you do something to your share, you take some legal action with respect to your share that has the effect of destroying one of the four unities. Um, more accurately, you destroy one of the first three because you can't destroy the fourth, it always must exist. But you do something to destroy the four, one of the first three unities. Then we start to look at the other two methods, and we saw that the other two methods operate only at equity, not at common law. And the first one refers to a mutual agreement. The second, sorry, number two under equity refers to mutual agreement. Number three refers to a course of dealings. So we looked at Burgess and Wansley, which illustrates number two. So there we saw that the uh, two joint tenants, they uh, initially own their house as joint tenants, but then they separate, and so. Um, Mrs. Ronsley makes an offer to buy out the share of um, Mr. Honick, and at first they have an agreement. So at first they agree to 750 pounds, but then she backs out and says no, she wants 1,000. So even though the agreement is not in writing, so it's not enforceable, it's not binding, and even though it's not carried out, at equity it still constitutes a mutual agreement for the purposes of severance. And so there was a severance there. Okay, so that then brings us to the next decision, which is Robichaud and Watson. So here it's a really similar situation. We have Mr. Robichaud and Ms. Watson who uh, decide to buy a house together as joint tenants, they're in a relationship, however the relationship ends, and Mrs. Watson uh, moves overseas to uh, England. So then she retains a lawyer, in order to get her share of the property. And Mr. Rochelle's lawyer makes an offer to her uh, for a certain amount, but she says that's not enough, so she won't accept it. So here the issue is, does this constitute a course of dealings under the third rule? Sorry, so, can I have a PowerPoint? Sorry? PowerPoint. Oh my goodness, thank you. Uh, sorry about that. Okay, so it's going to come on eventually. Okay, I think it's coming on now. Okay, so the point here in this case is that here we have an offer, but no counter offer, right? So different from Burgess and Lonsley where they actually come to an agreement. Here she makes an offer and, or sorry, he makes an offer and she just declines it. <coughs> So it's definitely not a mutual agreement, right? They don't actually have an agreement, but can this count as a course of dealing? So the reason this comes up is because after uh, the offer is made, rejected, then uh, we have Mr. Robichaud who dies. 
So then we have Ms. Watson, who's claiming that, well, it's a joint tenancy. She is a joint tenant, so she is just automatically entitled to his share. However, we have Mr. Robichaud's mother, who's the administrator of the estate, who argues that no, there was a severance at some point, and therefore his share should go to his estate, and from there to his heirs. Okay, so it turns out that the court says that yes, there is a severance here, and it operates according to the third rule of the course of dealings. So some of the reasons that the court gives is because here, the negotiations, even though there's just an offer and then a refusal, and no, not even a counteroffer, the negotiations, though, still show that they're treating their shares as being separate. So even though Ms. Watson doesn't make a counteroffer and she refuses the initial offer, her behavior indicates that she still wants to receive payment for her share. She still wants him to buy her out. Right? So it's not that she's expecting to go back and live in the house and continue to have that share. And of course, by virtue of the fact that Mr. Robichaud makes an offer, that shows that he intends for their shares to be separate. So there's an intention on both sides. Also, the very fact that they are separating their lives. Right? So she has moved out of the house and um, she doesn't come back to the property and she's not making any mortgage or tax payments. Right? So all of these different factors that show that they're separating their lives, that also shows that they intend for their interests to be separate. Right? The fact that their lives are no longer together means that their interests in the house are also intended to be separate. Okay, so then the final state of title as between the two of them is that we have uh, Ms. Watson, who is the sole legal owner at Common Law, because it's still a joint tenancy at Common Law, right? The severance was only effective at equity. So she is now the sole legal owner. However, she is holding the interest of both herself and the heirs of Mr. Robichaud in trust. Right? So both Mr. Robichaud's heirs and herself are beneficiaries in terms of they have the equitable title as tenants in common. Okay, so any questions about that decision? Uh, so we're saying that she, she does not get the promise as a whole. She has to share with the beneficiaries, correct? Exactly. Okay. Yeah. So she has the whole legal title. Mm -hmm. However, the fact that she has the whole legal title doesn't mean that she can do anything she wants with it because she's holding it in trust for both herself and uh, Mr. Robichaud's beneficiaries. Okay. Yeah. So she has to manage it for both of them. In terms of how she's going to do that, probably she's going to sell the house and then split the interest because most likely she doesn't want to live in the house with his heirs. Okay. So the next decision we have is Hanson Estate and Hanson. So this is our Ontario Court of Appeal decision, our recent decision. So this is our um, binding authority in our jurisdiction. Yeah. Sorry, just very quickly. From, uh, from last week in the Burgess case, you had mentioned that you have to communicate that you have an intention for the severance to take place. That can be done implicitly as well. It doesn't have to be on the severance. Exactly. And we're going to see that articulated in Hanson Estate as well. So. This is our Ontario Court of Appeal decision that kind of synthesizes the principles that we've seen play out in the, the previous, well, mostly in Burgess and Lawns. Yeah. yeah. Okay, so what happens here is we've got very similar facts to the first two. Uh, we've got Mr. and Mrs. Hanson. They are married. They live together. They own their house as joint tenants. However, their marriage ends, and Mrs. Hanson leaves the house. She moves out. And they both retain lawyers. And Mrs. Hansen's lawyer writes a letter to Mr. Hansen's lawyer that says that she wants to negotiate a separation between them. And she wants to achieve a straightforward division of their assets, is how the letter puts it. So then Mr. Hansen's lawyer writes back and says that he is preparing financial statements. So he's preparing a, a, a financial statement for Mr. Hansen, which would show what his assets are. Right? And you need to do that first so that you can divide them equally. So Mrs. Hansen uh, does the same. She executes a financial statement, and she also gets an appraisal for the house to see what the um, market value is for the house. And Mr. Hansen does the same thing. He executes a financial statement, but before he is able to actually give it to um, Mrs. Hansen's lawyer, he dies. Before he died, though, he did one more thing. He made a new will, 
So he makes a new will, and in his new will, he excludes Mrs. Hansen as a beneficiary. Okay, so in the new will, Mrs. Hansen is no longer a beneficiary at all, and instead he leaves his estate to his daughters from a previous marriage. Okay, so again, there's no agreement here between them, and in fact, there is a way to look at this where we can say that there isn't even really negotiations. There's just an initial offer to negotiate by Mrs. Hansen's lawyer, and then, but there's not even actually um, any numbers exchanged, right? So it's just an invitation to negotiate. Let's uh, enter into a separation agreement and um, divide the assets, but there isn't actually any numbers that are put forward. Okay, so here, just like in the other cases, we have Mrs. Hansen arguing that they're joint tenants. Therefore, she automatically gets Mr. Hansen's share, which means she gets the whole house, according to her argument. But then we have Mr. Hansen's daughters, who are arguing, no, there was some severance at some point before he died, and therefore, the, his share goes to them. Okay, so because we have this scenario where there isn't even and any actual uh, negotiation, right? There's really just an invitation to, to negotiate. There aren't even actually numbers exchanged between them or any number put forward. Because of that, the judge at first instance says that this cannot amount to a course of dealings, right? There's not enough actual um, discussion between the parties to amount to a course of dealings showing that they intend for their shares to be separate. However, the court of appeal rejects that reasoning. Right? So the court of appeal says that this is not about matching fact pattern to fact pattern. So it's not about looking to see whether there's an offer and a counter offer, you know, as we saw in previous cases. Instead, what we have to do, and this is the test that the court of appeal gives us, is that we have to look at the entire evidence, the totality of the evidence, and look at the entire course of dealings in order to see if the parties mutually intended for their shares to be treated as distinct and separate. So some things to emphasize about this decision is that the Perry Court Appeal puts a lot of emphasis on the mutuality aspect. Right? So this is different from uh, what we saw with Lord Denning in Burgess and Wansley, where Lord Denning contemplated the possibility that it could be just one of the co-owners who articulates this desire to treat their shares as separate, and that can be enough as long as that's communicated. But here the emphasis is on the mutuality. In other words, both parties have to indicate an intention that they're treating their shares as separate. What the court also emphasizes here, though, is that they don't have to do that explicitly, and they don't have to do it necessarily in words. Okay, so the court can infer their intention to treat their shares as separate, and they can infer it from their communications, so they can infer it from the things they say. So they can infer it in the sense that you don't have to explicitly say, let's treat our shares as separate, right? You can just infer it from the kinds of things they're saying. But the court will also infer this intention from their behavior, or in other words, from their conduct, from the kinds of things that they do. So like I said, this is the uh, Terry Court Appeal decision, so this is what is binding for us. And so we follow this as opposed to uh, Lord Denning's principle from Burgess and Ronsley. Okay, so in terms of applying these principles to this case, the court says that here when we look at all of the evidence, the entire course of conduct of Mr. and Mrs. Hansen, it shows that they're in the process of separating their lives. Right? And that fact of separating their lives is showing that they intend for their shares to be separate as well. So she's moved out of the house, they have separate lawyers, and they've opened separate bank accounts. Also, her lawyer sends this invitation to negotiate, right? this letter saying that uh, the plan is to achieve a division of their property in, uh, for the sake of a separation agreement. And even though Mr. Hansen's lawyer doesn't explicitly say, yes, we will achieve a separation of the assets you know, by virtue of a separation agreement, he does respond saying that he's preparing a financial statement. 
So by virtue of that, it's an implicit agreement or acknowledgement that yes, they're going to you know, work towards a separation agreement. So the court makes the point that Mr. Hanson's lawyer doesn't disagree with the offer that they're going to uh, try to achieve a straightforward division of assets. And here the court makes the point that a straightforward division of assets just means an equal division, right? They're just going to split it 50-50. So it's not really necessary for them to be putting forward numbers back and forth because they've essentially agreed on the 50-50 split. Now they just have to find out what their assets are worth and then uh, actually split them 50-50. Okay, so there's also this factor that Mr. Hansen rewrites his will. Right, so he rewrites his will in a way that excludes Mrs. Hansen and instead gives all of his assets to his daughter from a previous marriage. So we can ask ourselves, how significant is this when it comes to affecting a severance? And it is something that the court mentions and takes into account. However, it's important to keep in mind that rewriting your will in a way that excludes the joint tenant or even purports to give your share to someone other than the joint tenant, that by itself cannot affect the severance, right? And the court emphasizes that. If it could, then the uh, right of survivorship would be completely hollow, right? So it, it must be the case that merely rewriting your will and merely leaving your share to someone else in your will by itself has no effect in terms of severance. Also, we see the principle that I just mentioned here that there must be a mutual intention. So rewriting your will by itself is just a unilateral intention, right? So by itself, again, it couldn't be effective for that reason. However, the court does say that Mr. Hansen rewriting his will to exclude Mrs. Hansen is just one more factor that is consistent with all the other factors that they list that show that they're separating their lives and therefore treating their shares as being separate. Okay, so there is a severance here under the course of dealings, the third method. So it's a severance at equity only. So the final result is similar to the first two decisions that we looked at, right? So at law, Mr. Hansen and Mrs. Hansen remain joint tenants. And so what that means is that when he dies, she becomes the sole legal owner of the house at common law. However, there is a severance at equity. So at equity, they're now tenants in common. So that what that means is that when he dies, his share goes to his heirs, to whoever he leaves it to in his will, in this case, his daughters from another marriage. And Mrs. Hansen, of course, still retains her share at equity. So she is the sole owner at law but she is holding the house in trust for herself and Mr. Hansen's heirs. Okay, so any questions about that decision and severance? Yes, uh, Professor, if the court finds that there's a joint tenancy, there is a beneficial in getting early imposed to Mrs. Hansen, right? Sorry, can you say that again? If the court finds that there's a joint tenancy, right, in what it is now, then uh, Mrs. Hansen gets everything. Right. Exactly. So if there had not been a severance, then Mrs. Hansen would just have the whole house. And would not have to share the beneficiaries. Exactly. She would have it both at common law and at equity. It would just be hers, mm -hmm. the okay. whole title. Yeah. Okay. So those are the three ways of affecting a severance. Now, what happens though if we have two joint tenants and one of them dies, but the reason that one of them dies is because the other one murdered that one. Right? So now the one who is left standing, the murderer, is entitled to the other one, the victim's share, because they're joint tenants. Right? So automatically the victim's share goes to the murderer. So is that is that what's going to happen? Okay, so it turns out that no, the courts have come up with a way to get around that result because it seems unfair, right? So because of that, equity has stepped in and come up with a different result. So we see this in the Showball and Barber decision. So here we have Mr. and Mrs. Barber. Mr. Barber murders Mrs. Barber and then claims to um, be entitled to her share of the house because they were joint tenants. However, Mrs. Barber's sister uh, sues to try to stop this from happening. 
And the court, of course, is very sympathetic. They don't want Mr. Barber to be able to profit from his murder. However, the court can't just say, for no reason, oh, Mr. Barber's going to lose. They have to come up with some explanation that is coherent within our legal system. So what the court does is it imposes a constructive trust on Mr. Barber. So if we talked about a trust. A constructive trust is just a trust that arises through operation of law as opposed to one that parties create themselves. So what this means is that the right of survivorship still operates at law. So it's still the case that at common law, Mr. Barber now has the sole legal title. He's the sole owner. The constructive trust though operates at equity. And what it says is that Mr. Barber is holding the uh, shares in the house for himself and for Mrs. Barber's heirs. So in other words, this is essentially a de facto severance, right? It's not really a severance, it's not one of the three methods of severance, but the actual practical consequence is the same as what we saw for those examples of severance. So another way to put it is that the murder of one joint tenant by another joint tenant results in a, a practical severance or a de facto severance. Okay, so, yeah, um, so, so I have a question, maybe it's irrelevant, I don't know. So public policy does not have anything with that uh, part, the same as the way? So we did see public policy was uh, relevant when it comes to conditions and, for instance, murder, right? So if you have a condition saying that um, if you want to inherit this property, you have to go murder so-and-so, right? That would be um, void for violating public policy. So public policy comes into play with conditions and in particular where there's the public element and at least we talk about all those cases. So here it's not because of public policy that the court is imposing this constructive trust, but just this notion of fairness, right, or unfairness, that um, Mr. Barber could somehow get the share of the victim that he was, that he murdered. In this case, is uh, that one specifically because of the murder, or can it be, I don't think, for all the principles say that, it the husband, the, 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 the husband here, the torture the wife. Okay, so we don't have cases on that. Um, I mean, here the murder is also relevant because she dies, right? So, and then it's, it's the fact that she dies that then triggers the issue of where is the share going to go. Um, but it could be that he does something less than murder that is still you know, unconscionable, and then she somehow dies anyway, not because of his acts. Um, so, I mean, we would have to, um, it's an open question, right? So it hasn't been decided. So we would have to look at the policy rationales underlying this decision and see if they're applicable in lesser circumstances. So it, on one hand, it seems like the, the kinds of policy rationales that are relevant here, this notion of the murderer not being able to um, benefit from their act of murder, should probably apply in the kind of situation you talked about. Uh, in terms of a counterpoint, can, you know, you might initially think, well, there's no possible counterpoint to this decision, but there, you could potentially make a counterpoint, which is that in this case, Mr. Barber, yes, he murdered Mrs. Barber, but he is going to, if he did in fact murder her, he's going to pay for that crime through the criminal legal system, right? So he's going to be sentenced and he's going to uh, then pay for that crime in that way. So here, this is like a second punishment being imposed on him, right? So if he goes through the criminal justice system and he's actually guilty, then he's paid his debt to society. So should he really have to pay for his crime twice? So that would be a possible counterpoint. Yeah, just something to add on. Um, we had a client, um, like she had a second um, property as a college, like it, she goes with her husband uh, occasionally. So then um, the husband abused her, she got uh, an a injunction to convince the, the husband to get closer to her. However, this doesn't remove her, uh, this doesn't remove his 
property interest in the property. So they actually had to split the profits of that property. So although there is a, there's a like criminal um, thing saying that he can he like they are no longer they can no, no longer be together. It doesn't remove his uh, property interest from the from the um, from the assets of the wife. Yeah, excellent. That's great because that actually leads us right into our next topic. So our next topic are what are the rights and obligations of co-owners? And I mentioned in the last class that the overarching principle that the common law applies here is that the common law just sets up the possibility of the relationship between co-owners but doesn't police it. So the common law provides very little rules as to what the co-owners can and cannot do. Instead, it's really up to the co-owners themselves to manage their relationship. And if they can't do that, then they should just stop being co-owners, right? They should just sell the property, split the proceeds according to their shares, and go their separate ways and not co-own things together. Sorry, in other words, you're saying that it's not regulated? Uh, yeah, for the most part. There's yeah. two exceptions, though. So the common law does provide for two actions, and so we're going to talk about those. The first one is an action for waste. So what this says is that if one co-owner damages the land in such a way that it violates an action for waste, then the other co-owner can bring this action against them. So the emphasis here, though, is that in order for the action for waste to be available, one co-owner has to uh, do something that results in a destruction of the property. Right? So it's not enough to merely damage the property a little bit. You have to destroy the property um, so, for example, some action that unreasonably diminishes the value of the property would uh, constitute waste. The other action that the common law allows for is an action of ouster. And so this gets to the example that we were just talking about. So, an action of ouster refers to a situation where one co-owner is preventing the other co-owner from accessing the property. The reason this exists is because of the fourth unity. Right? So remember I said that the fourth unity applies to both um, joint tenancy and tenancy in common. So remember the fourth unity is the unity of possession. Mm -hmm. And what it says is that all co-owners are equally entitled to possession of all of the property. Right? So no co-owner can exclude any other co-owner from any part of the property. So what that means is that if one of them does, then they're ousting the other, right? If they try to exclude a co-owner, they're ousting the uh, co-owner, and so the one who is being ousted, who's being excluded, can bring an action of ouster. Okay, so those were the only actions available at common law. So under statute, we do have another action now, which is an action of accounting, or in other words, an action for account. So an action for account asks, when is one co-owner entitled to a payment from another co-owner? So historically, like I said, this was not available at common law, but it is now available through statute. So in particular, in Ontario, it's section 122 sub 2 of the Court of Justice Act, which provides for an action for account. So the specific language says that one co-owner can bring an action for account against another if that other one has received more than their just share. Okay. So in terms of what this means, what does it mean to receive more than your just share? We have the read and read decision to illustrate this for us. So what's happening in read and read is we have two brothers who are co-owners of a farm. So Douglas and Lawrence. However, one of them, Douglas, goes off and works in the mines. Whereas Lawrence stays on the farm and works the farm, right? So Lawrence works the farm day in and day out does all of the um, planting, the tending to the farm, and then the harvesting. So years go by like this, and then Douglas, who is the one who left, claims that he's entitled to a share of the profits from the farm, right? Because he's a co-owner of the farm. So here, does Douglas have a right of an action of accounting against Lawrence, the one who stayed on the farm? So there is a limited action for accounting that's available 
uh, between co-owners according to this provision of the Courts of Justice Act. And although we're in Saskatchewan with the Reed Reed decision, there's a similar provision that was applicable there as well. Now, it's only available, though, in limited circumstances. And the test is set out on the third page of the handout. So what it says is, if a co-owner receives more than his just share, and he receives more than his just share within the meaning of the statute, if he receives money or something else, which the co-tenants are entitled to simply by their being tenants in common, or joint tenants is available in that case as well, and if the amount which he receives and keeps is more than the portion of his interest as such a tenant, but he does not receive more than his just share, if he merely had the sole enjoyment of the property, even though by the employment of his own industry and capital he makes a profit by the enjoyment and takes the whole of such profit. Therefore, an action of account, proof of such enjoyment and receipt of the whole of the profits is not evidence of the occupying co-tenant uh, having entitlement to account to the other. Yep, so if you take a look at the third page of the handout under uh, relations between and among co-owners, sorry the pages aren't numbered, but it's the, um, the paragraph that's in the middle there, so it's like, it's like right here. Yeah. Okay, so what did all that mean? What's the, the principle that we should take away from that passage that I read there? Okay, so the, the short answer as to what that passage was getting at is that if one of the co-owners receives some profit or some money from the land just by virtue of owning the land, then they are obligated to account to the other co-owner for that profit. In other words, to give the other co-owner their share based on their respective shares. However, if one co-owner gets some profit from the land because they put their work, their labor, their industry into the land, then they are not obligated to account to the other co-owner. Even though some of the profits come in from the land, because they put their own labor and industry into it, they're entitled to keep all that profit for themselves. So here we see that labor principle coming up again in the common law. Okay, so in terms of what are some examples to illustrate this? So what are some examples of ways that you might receive a profit from the land just by virtue of owning it without putting your labor into it? Like what what would that what might that mean? Some part can be acquired, can be sold. Yeah, like if you just sell a part of it, exactly. So if you just sell a part of it, then you're going to have to account to your co-owner and divide it according to your shares, exactly. What else? So the road is made and the government acquires that land. If the government acquires it? Yeah, land? yeah. Exactly, yes. So if the government just expropriates a piece of your land and gives you payment for it, which is a common law principle, then you can't keep it all to yourself. You have to share it with your co-owner according to your shares. Uh, so what else? What are some other possible examples? Yeah, Maybe leasing uh, the property somewhere? Exactly. So if you just lease out the property or a part of it, then you can't keep all of that for yourself. You're going to have to account exactly. Um, or if you sell someone else a license to go onto the property and make some use of it, even if it falls short of being a lease, same thing. Okay, so then the next question is, well, where do we draw the line between putting your labor into the land and merely making a profit by virtue of owning the land, right? How exactly do we distinguish between these? And an example that we can use is that of a boarding house. And this came up in the Spellman and Spellman decision. So here, it's, it's a boarding house, but it's very similar to a hotel as well. So when you think about it, someone who's living in a boarding house or paying for the use of a room in a boarding house, they're not just paying to use the land. They're also paying for services, right? So there's the cleaning of the room. Um, the owner also supplies clean bedding, for instance. In some cases, the owner might supply some food as well. So here we have uh, co-owners, and one of them makes a claim for an accounting because of the profits from a boarding house. However, the court refuses. The court says there's no order for accounting here. The reason the court gives, they say it's just too difficult to try to divide up 
how much of the profit came from the labor that was invested into running the boarding house, and how much came from just the use of the land, right? Just the use of the property, just using the room. So the result is that the person who's running the boarding house and investing their labor in it, they get to keep all the profits, right? Because there's no order for accounting. Individual running the boarding house got to keep their profits. Okay. Yeah, exactly. So essentially, the labor principle kind of takes over, right? It sort of overrules here, even though arguably it's not just by virtue of labor that they got this profit. Some of it was just by virtue of the tenants just using the land, just being in the room. Yeah. So. Uh, about the, uh, the previous case, uh, so you said that if you sell a part of uh, of your share, you have to account the other one? Yes. But if you sell the, the whole share, you don't need to count the other one, right? Yeah, so if you, if you sold the whole land, then yes, you would have to account your co-owner as well. I mean, you couldn't really sell the whole thing without their permission because they're a co-owner. But if the whole thing does get sold, and or if the whole thing gets expropriated, there would be an accounting to the other co-owner. But if you sell your own share? Okay, so here we're talking about selling the actual land, not your share. Okay, so you can sell your own share without accounting to them because you've only sold your own share. Okay. But in the examples that we're talking about here, we're talking about selling like a piece of the land, a parcel of the land, or the whole land. Okay. Okay. okay, so the next topic is, let's say that you are co-owners with someone of some land, but you don't want to be co-owners anymore, right? You're not getting along, you don't want to have to live in this house with this person. What can you do? How can you terminate the relationship? So, as I mentioned, under the common law, there's no remedy, right? The only common law remedies we saw were the action for waste and the action of ouster. So under the common law, you had um, nothing, right? So if you couldn't convince your co-owner to either buy out your share or to sell the whole property together and split the proceeds or to uh, somehow split the property, you are out of luck. <coughs> However, now under statute in Ontario, we do have a resolution. So we have the Partition Act and it allows that a co-owner can apply to court in order to get a court order to force the other co-owner to either partition the land or to sell it. So a partition refers to physically dividing the land, right? So it's the, a physical division of the land as opposed to severance with a conceptual division of the joint tenancy. Now we're talking about actually physically dividing the land. So section two allows for the possibility and then section three tells us essentially which one is available and when, right? So it says that you can apply for partition or for sale if sale is considered to be more advantageous. So the significance of this wording is that partition has been held to be the default and sale is only available if there is some specific reason in favor of sale. And this is spelled out in Cook and Johnston, right? So Cook and Johnston is the authority for this proposition that partition is the default and uh, sale is only available when it's more beneficial. So what we have in Cook and Johnston is we have these co-owners and they co-own a uh, cottage property together. So it's an island, <coughs> an entire island with a cottage on it. And so one of them applies for um, either partition or sale and the court says you get partition because that's the default. So in terms of what it would take it for the court to order sale instead? The court says that sale has to be more beneficial and a sale would only be more beneficial when the land has the kind of character which makes it unreasonable to partition it. So for instance, if the land is a parcel of land with a house on it, that's almost always going to be an example where sale is more beneficial. Right? because it's not reasonable in most cases to partition a house. 
Now, this case, though, is essentially an exception to that principle because this is a, a big piece of land with a cottage on it. However, the reason why partition is available here and why it's the preferred remedy is because, first of all, the island is very large, right? So it's um, 500 to 600 feet in length and 150 feet across. And the cottage is on one end of it, right? So it's not like the cottage is right in the middle or it's not like the cottage takes up the whole piece of land. If the cottage took up the whole piece of land, then it would be clear that partition is not reasonable. <coughs> So it's on one end of it. Also, only one of the co-owners had spent the money to build the cottage. And so that one co-owner had always used the cottage, whereas the other co-owner, whenever they used the island, they tented on the other end. So it is actually reasonable in these circumstances to partition it down the middle and give one of them the cottage and the other one gets the part of the land without the cottage. The other reason that the court gives is that this cottage property was um, rare, that there wasn't a lot of similar cottage properties available in that area. And so if they were forced to sell, then they would have to take their chances of finding their own similar cottage properties, and that might be very difficult. Okay, so some other examples of when the court orders partition or when it orders sale. So in Ponvert and Wood, that's an example where the court orders partition. And here, the facts were that, although it's one piece of land to start with, it could easily be divided into three exact equal pieces. And there's three co-owners. And so the court says, yes, that's a good candidate for partition. So we can contrast that with Rouse and Rouse, and this is where the court orders a sale instead. The reason here is because the co-owners in Rouse and Rouse were the first wife of, uh, one of the deceased and the deceased's second wife. Okay, so through a combination of inheritance and um, you know, separation and so on, somehow the two wives of this one man become co-owners of the property together. And so the court says that if you're going to try to partition this property, you would have had to have created a right of way over one of the pieces that would have gone right beside that house. And in other words, these two women would have had to have been in close contact with each other going forward. And they did not have a good relationship, and so that was not going to work out. And so the court says that's one example where sale is more beneficial. Okay, so another issue that comes up in terms of partition sale is when can a court refuse to order either partition or sale? Right? So let's say one party is applying to court trying to get an order for partition or sale. When can the court say, no, we're not going to give you either at this time? So here the key authority is Milton and Bartlett. So what was happening in Milton and Bartlett is that we start off with Mr. and Mrs. Bartlett, and they're married, and they begin as joint tenants, uh, co-owning their house together as joint tenants. However, Mrs. Bartlett secretly, unknown to Mr. Bartlett, conveyed her share to herself, affecting a severance at common law. Okay, so he doesn't know that this happened. Then she dies, and she left her share to her brother. So now her brother, Mr. Knowlton, and her husband are co-owners of Mr. Bartlett's house together. Okay, so Mr. Knowlton, the brother, he applies for partition or sale, right? So he now legitimately has a half share of this house and he wants his equity out of this house. However, the court refuses to give him either partition or sale at this time. So here the court says that the general rule is that the court has discretion to refuse to order a partition or sale. And that the test for deciding whether the court is going to exercise that discretion is it's going to look at what are the relative hardships to each party. Okay, so we're going to look for what are the hardships experienced by each of the parties if we do or do not order a partition or sale. <coughs> 
And when we look at the facts in this case, we have Mr. Bartlett living in this house. This house had actually belonged to his parents. So he had lived there for almost 40 years. And he's 63 years now. And he didn't know that his wife had severed it. And so he didn't know that anyone else would ever be getting the interest. He thought he was going to live there forever. He thought that if she uh, predeceased him, the interest would go to him. And that he would just live out his days there. Right? He was planning to basically die in that house. So the court says that if Mr. Bartlett is forced to leave this house, his childhood home, where he was never intending to leave, that that would be a real hardship for him. And that for Mr. Knowlton, there is no hardship. There was no evidence that he uh, required the equity from this house for any reason. So the court does say, though, that if circumstances change in the future, then Mr. Knowlton can apply again. And so the examples that they give of the kinds of circumstances that might change the court's mind going forward are, for instance, if Mr. Bartlett is failing to maintain the property, or if Mr. Bartlett is no longer living in the property and he no longer needs it to live in, or if Mr. Knowlton puts forward some evidence showing that he is experiencing a hardship because he cannot access his equity out of the house. Those are all reasons the court would reconsider and possibly order a uh, uh, sale going forward. So again, the court also makes the point that here, although uh, Mr. Milton's initially asking for the possibility of partition, it's a house, so partition is not going to be reasonable, that the only option, if they were to grant it, would have been a sale. Okay, so another case that we have on this question is Patel and Kirshen. So here we have an older couple and their daughter who own a townhouse together. And the daughter's children also live in the townhouse. And the parents bring an application for partition or sale because they're no longer able to live in the house. They um, have health issues and so they can't walk up and down all the stairs, right? It's one of those townhouses that's tall and narrow. But the daughter doesn't want to leave because one of her children, her son, is starting university nearby. And so she doesn't want to have to move out of the area. However, the court says that that's not a sufficient reason to refuse to order partition or sale. So this is often a reason that does work. So if you have children in the home and a sale would force them to leave and they'd be uprooted and have to leave their school, then that is often a reason that the court accepts. Here, this child, though, is an adult, and the school is university. So that's why it's less convincing, right? So this rationale works better when it's young children, where uprooting them would actually be more traumatic. about in terms of partition sale apply in a residential context. However, there's a slightly different test when it comes to a commercial context. And here we see the test articulated in Garfella Apartments. So what's happening here is that we have this apartment structure where it's not a condominium, so don't get confused by that, but it's an apartment structure. However, there are um, 147 different interests. Okay, there's 147 different owners. And even though they don't own specific units the way that you do in a condo, by virtue of their ownership interest, they have an entitlement to specific units. So they have an entitlement to live in specific units. Okay, so here, Garfella, this uh, company, acquires 124 of the 147 interests. So it has majority interest in this commercial building. And what Garfell wants to do is to acquire all of the interest so that they can uh, redevelop the apartment building and uh, turn it into a regular apartment building and make money off of renting it out. However, all the other owners, the 23 other owners, don't want to sell their interests, right? They're living in these units and they don't want to sell them. So Garfella applies to the court to try to get a court order for sale, to try to force um, 
the owners to all have to sell their interests. So here the court refuses. The court refuses to order either partition or sale. So the key test here, the key principle that comes from this decision is that in the commercial context, there's only a limited basis for denying a request for uh, partition or sale. In other words, in the commercial context, the court is more likely to order partition or sale. Another way to put it is that in a commercial context, the, those who are trying to oppose a partition or sale have a higher threshold to meet. So specifically, the test is the court looks for has there been any oppressive conduct on the part of uh, the co-owner who is seeking partition or sale. And here the oppressive conduct is loosely based on the oppression remedy that comes from uh, the legislation that applies to minor minority corporate shareholders. So what the test is, is first the court looks at what are the reasonable expectations of the parties. So here the court says that the minority uh, interest holders, the ones who are living in their units, that their reasonable expectation is that they were going to continue to live in their units. So the way that this structure works is that you can share your, in, or, sorry, you can sell your shares, right? So their reasonable expectation is that if there are any other co-owners who no longer want to be co-owners, that they would just sell their shares. Not that they would try to force everybody to sell and force people out of their units. So the second part of this test is, has the co-owner who is seeking partition or sale, have they engaged in any oppressive conduct that amounts to coercive, abusive conduct or unfairly disregarding the minority interests? If they have, then it's a reason for the court to refuse partition or sale. So here the court says that yes, Garfella has engaged in oppressive conduct. And this part is not as clear in the passage that's reproduced in your text. But what Garfella was doing was that um, they were also the uh, management office for this building. And so when anyone wanted to sell their share to a third party, that third party had to go through Garfella, they had to go through the management office and get approved essentially by Garfella. So Garfella was discouraging prospective purchasers from buying from the minority shareholders. They're basically preventing that from happening. So what it meant is that the minority shareholders weren't able to sell their interest to third parties. And so Garfella was setting up a situation where if they wanted to sell, the only people they could sell to was Garfella. So the court says that this amounts to oppressive conduct. Okay, so even though it's a higher threshold in a commercial context for the court to deny partition or sale, we do have an example here of the court doing that, right? So here the court denies partition or sale. And it's partly because even though this is a commercial context, there's a residential element to it, right? So the unit holders, the, the shareholders, are living in the units. So there's a kind of residential um, context here. But also it does give us the test and it does show us an example of the test being met of Garfella engaging in oppressive conduct. Yeah. Is it a reasonable expectation and oppressive conduct or both? Both. The court looks at both of those things. Yeah. Maybe this is crossing into the Indian companies also. So, but you know, there's another way around this that means that the minority shareholders can force the majority shareholders to buy out their shares because it is aggressive. So, that means if the, the, it means the, the plaintiff and the defendant change the place in this case, the court decision, because the, the minority, the, means the minority interest holders, they're not having this uh, <coughs> majority interest holders. So, they apply to the court to party. Okay, I'm not sure if I completely followed, but um, so are you asking 
what if it's reversed and what if it's the minority shareholders who are asking for a partition or sale in this context? How would this test apply? Yeah, so in that case, they would get partition or sale because um, as far as we can tell, there is no indication that they've been engaged in any oppressive conduct. So there's no reason to deny them partition or sale. And um, if you follow the principle in, in Nobleton versus Parler, it says that um, the court will look into the hearts of those parties. So or can we not apply this principle in this situation? Yeah, so great question. And that shows it's two different tests, right? So in the residential context, the test is just look at the relative hardship to the parties as to whether we're going to grant or deny partition or sale. Okay, so that's the residential context. In the commercial context, it's a different test. So, so the, the point is, no, we've got two different tests. However, the test in the commercial context, our example here, it's arguably not applied as stringent, stringently as it might otherwise be because there's also a, a sort of residential element insofar as some of the interest holders are living in the units. Okay. So that brings us to the end of co-ownership and then brings us to our next topic which is non-possessory interest in land. Okay, so when we're talking about non-possessory interest in land, what we're talking about are interests that are sometimes referred to as incorporeal breadments. So this is a term that comes from uh, the common law or the term servitude which comes from Roman law. So these are interests in land that are less than full title. So these are property rights that are only one of the strands in the bundle, and in particular, the strand of use, right? So not the strand of possession, but just the strand of use. So we're going to look at three different instances of non-possessory interest, a profit fondra, easement, and covenant. Okay, so in terms of going through each one. First, a proper contra. So this refers to a right to enter onto someone else's land and to extract some part of that land and keep it for yourself. So the thing that you extract could be something like timber, cutting down trees, crops, so harvesting crops, um, extracting turf, like taking the earth itself, the soil, the grass, catching fish, so we saw an instance of this in the Royal Bank and Sony decision where the license to catch fish was compared to a profit pondra, or hunting and taking animals. Also minerals, right? So for instance, a mineral right or a right to mine has been characterized as a profit pondra in the tenor decision by the Supreme Court of Canada. So the other key principle to take from the tenor decision is that a proper pondra includes not just a right to the produce of the land, but the right to enter onto the land in order to get the produce from it. Even if that right to enter onto the land isn't explicitly stated as part of the proper pondra, it's built into it, or in other words, implied. Okay, so in terms of where do profit pranjas come from? How do they arise? They can arise in a few different right ways. They can arise expressly by agreement. So the parties could just make an agreement. Um, you know, you can say to uh, your neighbor, if you want to come onto my land and hunt the rabbits from my land, you just have to pay me this amount of money per year, right? You can make that agreement together. It can arise by statute or it can arise by prescription. So in other words, by doing the action for a long period of time. Okay, so just as we saw a key issue with respect to leasehold estates is whether something is a lease or a license, there's also a question of whether, or what is the difference between a profit or and a license? So a license, remember, is a contractual right, not a property right. So what that means is that an interest or a right under a license is generally terminable at any time on reasonable notice or in accordance with the terms of the license. And we contrast this with a profit contra. So the reason we're talking about a profit contra in this course is because it's a property interest. 
And the significance of it being a property interest is that it runs with the land, that's attached to land. In other words, it binds subsequent land owners, even if they don't have privy of contract with the uh, initial person who holds the proper contract. Okay, so we're not going into a lot of detail on uh, Papa Pandra, mostly because many of the principles are similar or the same as the principles for easement. So we're going to uh, focus on easements. Okay, so an easement is the right of one person to go on to someone else's land and make some use of it. So it differs from a Papa Pandra because it's not a right to go and take something from the land, but just a right to go and do something on someone else's land, to do something or to use it for some reason. And the classic example of an easement is a right of way. So for instance, suppose that suppose that we have a piece of land and a owns this piece of land, but A wants to divide it and sell the north part to B. However, the road is right here. And imagine that the rest of the area all around the land is built up, right? So it's all occupied by other uh, buildings. So A is keeping this part for himself, but wants to sell the north part to B. However, B is not going to buy this land if it's landlocked. So A can Suppose there's a road right here, or a driveway, or some type of access, A can say, well, I'll give you a right of way across the part that I keep for myself. In other words, B has an easement to get to B's northern property. Okay, so in terms of some key terminology. So dominant tenement and servant tenement are key terms that we're going to be using throughout. So dominant tenement refers to the parcel of land that receives the benefit of the easement. Okay, so dominant tenement is the parcel that benefits from the easement. The survey tenement is the parcel of land that has the burden of the easement. In other words, the easement is being applied to the survey tenement. It's burdening the survey tenement. So in this example, which parcel is dominant tenement and which parcel is survey tenement? So um, B would be the dominant tenement, yeah. and A would be the surrogate tenement in the circumstance. Yeah, exactly. Okay, so next question, what makes an easement a property right? And we've already touched on this with respect to uh, previous topics. I just talked about proper prandra and also uh, with leasehold interests. What makes a property interest is that an easement, if it is an easement, if it meets all of the criteria, all of the requirements for an easement, then it runs with the land. In other words, it's part of title. So what this means is that when you sell the land, the easement goes with it. So in the example here, suppose that A sells this piece of land to C. If this is in fact an easement, and we're going to look at all the different requirements, then C is bound by this. C has a legal obligation to continue to let B use this right of way. Even though B and C have no contract between themselves, right? Even though there's no previous contract between them. And same thing, let's say that B sells to D. The same thing applies. So even though there's no previous contract between D and A or D and C, if it's an easement, B is still entitled to use this vis-a-vis -vis both A, if A was still the owner, or vis-a-vis -vis C, if C is still the owner. So um, I've noticed easements in, in, in property law, they turn up as an instrument on the parcel itself. So then that, that's another kind of visual to show that it's going to carry on. Okay, great. Yeah, thank that's, you. Yeah. Okay, great. In the practical world. Yeah, okay. What do you mean the parcel? Yeah, okay, great, yeah. Um, okay, so 
to sum it up, you can think about easements as being metaphysically attached to the land, right? They run with the land. And you can think of them as being relationships between parcels of land as opposed to relationships between the people, right? So if they're relationships between parcels of land, that's why they run with the land. Okay, so there are four requirements that something has to meet in order for it to count as an easement. In other words, it's not the case that every time someone lets someone else use their land, all of a sudden they have an easement for it, right? That's, that's not how it works. We've got these four requirements. They all have to be met in order for there to be an easement. Okay, so they are initially articulated in Ellenborough Park, and then they get spelled out in a number of subsequent decisions. So in terms of Ellenborough Park, what we have here is back in 1855, we have developers who own this huge parcel of land. And what they do is that they keep the middle chunk of the land as a park. So in the decision it refers to it as a pleasure ground. That makes it sound more interesting than it is. It's actually just a park. And then the properties around the outside of it, they develop as houses and then sell those houses off to individuals. And there's also a section of houses that are one street over, right? But there are also all these houses. The point is that when they sell them, the developers include an easement in the conveyances, which say that each of the people who bought the houses are entitled to use the park as a park. They have an easement to use the park. Okay, so that was 100 years ago, right? So now we're up to 1956. And so all of the original people involved are long dead, right? So the original developers are gone and all of the original people who bought the houses are gone. And we've got new owners of the park, right? So new people now own the park because the people whose houses are around it, they don't own the park, they just have an easement to use it. So the people who now own the park, they don't want to keep it as a park. Land is scarce. It's, you know, the 19th century, or it's 1950s now. They want to build something, like maybe build a shopping mall or something where they can make money. They're not making any money off this park. However, all of the house owners are contesting it and saying, no, we have a legal easement to use the park as a park. That means you are legally required to keep this as a park forever until we agree with you that we don't want it as a park anymore. Okay, so of course there's no privity of contract, right? Because all the original parties are dead. So if they, the owners of the houses are going to be able to force the owners of the park to maintain as a park, it'll have to be because there's an easement. And it turns out that they win. And so the park is required to stay as a park. And the court gives us the four requirements and shows that the, us that all four are met in this case. So the first requirement is that there has to be a dominant tenement and a servient tenement. Okay, so what this requirement really means for practical purposes is that there has to be a dominant tenement. You have to be able to identify a dominant tenement. Because practically speaking, you will, I think almost always, or probably always, be able to identify a servient tenement because if there's a claimed easement, there must be some land that is the subject of the easement, mm -hmm. right? So there's always going to be a servient tenement, but what we're really looking for here is, is there a dominant tenement? Okay, so we can uh, contrast this with a proper conjure, for example, where that wasn't a requirement. So it's not that the person who, um, who has the right to go onto someone else's land must have some adjoining nearby land. Right? So proper pondras can exist in gross, is how it's put. Whereas easements can't, because easements are characterized as a relationship between the land, not relationship between people. So there has to be some servant, not only a servant tenement, but there has to be some dominant tenement that's actually benefiting from the easement. Okay, so this is illustrated in the Ackroyd and Smith decision. So here, there was an agreement that um, the defendant would be able to use a road going across the plaintiff's land in order to get to the defendant's land. And the right had been granted to owners and occupiers of the dominant tenement, which is fine. So that meets this requirement. However, 
The problem was that the right was also granted to all persons having occasion to resort there too. In other words, having occasion to resort to the dominant tenement. But these other persons include anyone, right? So anybody who might happen to just want to go to the dominant tenement. But those people weren't owners of the dominant tenement or occupiers of the dominant tenement, right? They had no relationship to the dominant tenement. So here, those people couldn't have an easement, right? Because they have no dominant tenement that they can point towards. Okay, so there are some exceptions to this principle. So, of course, this is a common law principle, so it can be overridden by statute. So there are statutes which provide for easements for uh, certain utilities where it's not necessary for there to be any dominant tenement. So, for instance, in Ontario, we have um, the Water Resources Act, which provides for easements for uh, water and sewage. We could also have statutory easements for hydro and for electricity. So just to emphasize though, because of these statutory um, easements, that doesn't mean that any time there's any claimed easement to use a water service or to use electricity, that it's allowed because of the statute, right? You have to actually meet the requirements of the statute. Essentially, the statute allows the municipality to have easements for these things, even though the municipality doesn't have any specific dominant tenement. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Okay, so it's not that some individual private person can claim any easement with respect to water or electricity. The statutes allow municipalities to have these easements. Okay, so in this case, in um, Ellenborough Park, there was no issue. There's clearly a dominant tenement and a servant tenement. So which is which in Ellenborough Park? Yep. So the dominant tenement were the owners of uh, the houses and the servant tenement was the park owner. Yep, great, exactly. So all of the houses are the dominant tenements and the park is the servant tenement. Okay, so the second requirement is that the easement has to accommodate the dominant tenement. So the key principle, yeah, this is so in that way, do the owners and occupiers still have the easement? Yeah, um, I can't remember if that's specifically said there, but there's no reason why they wouldn't have the easement. Yeah. Okay, so what this refers to, the key principle here, is that the easement has to confer a benefit on the dominant tenement in terms of it being land as opposed to just giving some advantage to the owner of the dominant tenement in their personal capacity. So another way that it's put is that the um, easement has to make the land more beneficial in a way that applies indifferently as to who owns it. So for example, in Ellenboro Park, the court says that this requirement is met. So in terms of how to apply this test, it's going to depend on the nature of the land and what the land is good for, right? So both the nature of the dominant tenement, how the dominant tenement um, can be used and reasonable expectations about how it should be used and whether the easement fits in with that. So here, for example, in Elmborough Park, the dominant tenements are houses, right? Residential houses. And the point of the park, the court says, is that it's serving as a quote unquote garden. Okay, so that's also a, a Britishism. So whenever the court says garden, it will make more sense for us if we think of it as backyard. Okay, so what the court says is that having a garden is a natural part of having a residential house. That a garden, or in other words a backyard, is just part and parcel of a residential house. And so these houses didn't have their own backyards, basically. Instead, the Ellenborough Park was serving as a kind of communal backyard for all the houses. So 
a key point here is that whether this is met is going to depend on judicial values about what land should be used for, right? So here we see this reflection that having you know, an, this outdoor space is part and parcel of having a residential house. That might not resonate as much in present day in downtown Toronto, right? Where many people have houses where they do not have any access to a backyard or to any outdoor space. Okay, so we can contrast this with Hill and Tupper. So what was happening in Hill and Tupper is we have a landowner which is uh, adjacent to a canal. And they were granted the exclusive right to lease out boats on the canal. And then someone else, a neighboring landowner, they start leasing out boats on the canal as well. And the original person says, wait, you can't do that. I was given the exclusive right to lease out boats on the canal. However, the court says that this is not an easement. So here, the court says that what the first landowner was trying to do was set up a monopoly and claim to have a monopoly by way of an easement. However, the court says that this monopoly is not a benefit to the land itself. Instead, a monopoly would be a benefit to the owner. Right? It would be something that would be beneficial to them in their business enterprise, but not beneficial to the land itself. So whether that's persuasive to you or not is going to depend on whether you happen to agree with the kind of judicial values about the way land is used. Right? So you might think, well, maybe that land was only good for leasing out boats on a canal. For whatever reason though, this notion of setting up a monopoly according to judges is a benefit to the owners as opposed to benefiting the land. Okay, so we also see this uh, principle spelled out further and explained in Depew and Wilkes. So what's happening here is that we have a group of cottage owners and they're using this laneway, and they have an easement over the laneway in order to drive over it. So one of the cottage owners owns the laneway, and the other ones have an easement to drive over it. However, what they start doing is they start parking in the laneway as well. And so the owner claims that they're not entitled to do that, right? They only have the easement to drive over it, but not to park in it. However, the court disagrees, and the the group of cottagers win. They do have an easement to park in the laneway. So here, one of the key principles is that just because there is some alternative that is less convenient, you can still get the easement and can still accommodate the land. Okay, so the point here is that the owner was arguing that the uh, easement is not really accommodating the land because it wasn't reasonably necessary. Okay, so that's part of the test is, is the easement reasonably necessary in order to accommodate the dominant tenement? And the owner was arguing that in this case it's not because there was actually public parking nearby. So the owner was saying they could just go and park their cars in the public parking and then walk to their cottages. However, the court says that even though there is uh, an alternative nearby, it's not an absolute necessity that the court is looking for, right? So being able to park in the laneway was, it still counts as being reasonably necessary for the sake of showing that the easement does accommodate the dominant tenement. And the reason the court said that was they pointed to a number of different factors. So for instance, they pointed to safety. So the cottagers were older, they had mobility issues, and there was a lot of potholes from the public parking spot to their cottages, so they could have tripped and fallen as they were walking to their cottage. Uh, also health, as I mentioned, they were older, they had health issues, so it's difficult for them to walk from public parking to get to their cottages. Also availability, so sometimes the public parking was full and they couldn't find any place to park there. Uh, also, uh, if there had been an emergency, it's too far for them to have to walk to the public parking. 
So all of these factors go towards showing that it was reasonably necessary for them to uh, park in the laneway and that the public parking wasn't sufficient. Okay, so we'll do this one last decision on this talk before we uh, break. So here we have three cottages that are all beside each other. Three cottage properties. First one's owned by A, and we have B and then C. So this is water all around them, and the only A has road access. However, B has an easement across A's property, but poor C doesn't. So C has no way of getting to his property. So what he does is C enters into an agreement to um, lease out a little corner of B's property to park his car on. So then C starts driving along B's easement, goes and parks his car, and then walks in his property. Okay, however, A doesn't like this, and so A um, uh, brings an action to stop C from doing this, and the court agrees with A, right? So A wins. So C cannot get easement to enter A's land. And the reason is because the way that C is using the easement is not actually to accommodate the dominant tenement, which is B, right? So under B's easement, B is the dominant tenement, and A is the servant tenement. But what C was doing was using this easement in a way that was actually making C the dominant tenement. But that's not the easement that B has. B only has an easement for B's land to be the dominant tenement. And so for that reason, C loses, and is not entitled to uh, use that right of way. So how does it yeah. You'll have to pay, right? You'll have to pay A to use it. He can't just oh, get it for free. He wants to do it for free. And if A doesn't want to, maybe C shouldn't have bought this weird property, right? So, I mean, C didn't have to buy that property. Yeah. So you have to pay for all the easements. It's not something that comes to the land. So we are going to see that there are certain circumstances where easements arise by implication of law. And there are circumstances where easements can arise by prescription, but we haven't gotten there yet. So they can, they also arise expressly, right? They arise because the, the parties expressly agree to them. In this case, if they would have uh, previously owned seed land and then would have sold it to seed, then you would uh, be able to use this easement because you have sold that uh, the rear land and that's all you want to get to it. Yep, but so in this case you got from somebody else. Yep, so we're going to see that one of the criteria for an easement arising by implication of law is that initially all the parcels are owned by the same person and then they get divided, exactly. And we're going to see that one of the kinds is an easement of necessity. Okay. So if that had been the case, then yes, C could claim the easement of necessity. Presumably it wasn't, otherwise that would be the argument he makes here, right? So presumably they weren't initially all owned by the same person. Mm -hmm. So then here C would need to enter into negotiations with A and then with B. So and presumably with B as well, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Although it seems to have a better relationship with B, that doesn't seem to be the problem, but yeah. Um, okay, so let's take a break there and we'll come back in 20 minutes. that a right has to meet in order to be an easement under the Elmore Park test. So now we are moving on to the third. The third requirement says that the dominant tenant and the servant tenant have to be owned by different people. Okay, so the same person cannot both own, or cannot own both the dominant tenant and the servant tenant. So the rationale here is that one person can't have an easement over their own property, right? Because if it's your property, if you're the owner of it, you already have the right to use it by virtue of being the owner. So you can't have an easement over your own property. It's logically impossible. And so it doesn't make sense for someone to say that there's an easement over their own property. 
So in Elmborough Park, this wasn't an issue because the owners of the dominant tenant, the houses, they're clearly different people from the owners of the park. Okay, so this then brings up the doctrine of merger. So what happens when one and the same person does become the owner of both the dominant tenement and the servient tenements? There, the doctrine of merger says that if there had been an easement in that situation, then it's extinguished when the owner of the two parcels is the same person. Okay, so the doctrine of merger says that if there are two parcels, there's an easement over one of them, but then the same person comes to be the owner of both, the easement is extinguished. What is that hypothetical? Uh, you just have A and B. If A ends up uh, purchasing half of B's property, and A's a half of and B's a half of them, would that extinguish the easement? Okay, so they're co-owners. Yeah. Um, I've never turned my mind to that one, but yes, I think so. Yeah, I think that would be the same. It would just be the same as if, yeah, because by virtue of them being co-owners, um, A is, has the right not to be excluded from any part of it, and so A can't have an easement over any part of it. Professor Brown, great. Sorry for the interruption. The farm feeds the box on the floor here in the style, so anybody... Whoa, property law! <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Okay, so this issue also came up in the Mihalov decision. 
So here, the owner of the dominant tenement has an express easement for a water pipeline that goes under the Serbian tenement. And so they have an underground uh, water pipeline. However, then the, um, the pipe starts leaking, and so it's not working anymore. So the owner of the dominant tenement goes onto the Serbian tenement land, and without the permission of the Serbian tenement, they install an above ground water pipeline, right? Because the underground one wasn't working. And here, the court says that the easement is sufficiently definite, and it's not too wide and vague, it's an express easement. And it was an easement specifically to use an underground pipeline, quote unquote, in its present position. So what that meant was that the pipeline had to be underground. So when the dominant tenement owner put the above ground pipeline over the Serbian tenement, that was going above and beyond the easement, right? So they're not entitled to do that. Okay, the other uh, decision we have here that illustrates this principle is the Duckhart and District of Surrey decision. So here there was another easement that's an express easement, and it gave access to uh, an area of land in order to access the waters of the bay. Okay, so the owners of the dominant tenement were granted access over, the, over a piece of land in order to get to the waters of a bay. And the argument was that just having access to this land, this right to access the land, is too wide and vague, and therefore it doesn't meet this requirement. But the court rejects that, and they say that if the right in Ellenboro Park is not too wide and vague, then this claimed right is also not too wide and vague, right? So just as the right to use a park as a park is sufficiently definite, the right to access land in order to get to the water is also sufficiently definite. Okay, so next is 4B, the second sub-step under number 4. So here the claimed right, the thing that's claimed to be an easement, it can't be inconsistent with the proprietorship or possession of the Serbian owner. Okay, so here the point is that easement is just a right of use, right? It's only one of the strands of the bundle. It's not the right of possession. We saw that a lease, for instance, gives the right of possession, but an easement doesn't. And so if the claimed right is so broad that it actually amounts to a right of possession for the dominant tenement holder over the Serbian tenement, then it can't be an easement, right? It will violate this requirement. So the way this plays out in Ellenborough Park is that the owner of the park was arguing that here the rights that the homeowners are claiming amounts to possession, right? That because the, if this is an easement, then the owner of the park is going to be forced to just leave this as a park forever until they can you know, somehow buy out the interests of all those house owners. And so their point is that the house owners basically have a right of possession now and that the possession of the owners of the park is completely displaced, that they have no ability to possess the park themselves or to exercise their proprietorship, their ownership over the park, because there's nothing they'll be able to do with the park except leave it as a park. Okay, so it turns out that the court rejects this as well, and they say that no, the owners of the park, their proprietorship is still intact. So they can still exercise the rights of an owner over the park. And so the examples that the court gives of uh, the way that the owners can still exercise rights of ownership is that they can still cut down some trees, right? As owners, they can cut down, cut down some trees. They can't cut down all of them, of course, because then it wouldn't be a park anymore. But they can cut down some and sell the trees. Uh, they could um, cut down some flowers and shrubs if they want to well. Not all of them, of course, but some of them. Okay, so this case is, is very borderline on this principle, right? It seems that arguably the owners of the park are having their ownership and proprietorship uh, displaced in this situation. However, this is uh, a precedent and the court did hold that they still have rights of ownership that they can exercise. Okay, so another good case that illustrates this principle is uh, shelf holdings and husky oil. 
So what's happening here is that there is an express easement between the parties, so between the owner of this land, which is um, Show, they give an easement to Husky Oil in order to put a pipeline under Shelf's land. And um, here, the issue is that does this uh, comply with this requirement? And the court holds that this requirement is not a problem because the only restrictions on shelf holding is that they can't interfere with the soil where the pipeline is going through, right? So they can't interfere with the soil where the pipeline is, and they can't build any structures on the land immediately above the pipeline. However, the rest of the surface is still available for the owners to use, and the land is being used as a farm. So they couldn't build right above the pipeline, but they could still use the land as a farm. They could still graze their cattle there. And so the court said that they still had uh, rights of an owner, and they still had possession over the surface of the land. Okay, so the third and final sub-requirement under number four is that the claimed right, the right that's claimed to be an easement, has to be a right of utility and benefit and not a right of mere recreation and amusement. Okay, so the court cites the Mounsey and Ismay case in order to support this. So in Mounsey and Ismay, what was happening was that there was a, a group of citizens who had a right every year to use a horse track in order to hold horse races on one day. Right, so one day out of every year, they have a right to go and hold some horse races on a horse track. And they claim that this right was an easement. However, the court rejects this and says, no, this can't be an easement because it's not a right of utility and benefit, holding horse races. Instead, holding a horse race is just an amusement. It's a recreation. So it doesn't count as an easement. Okay, so we can contrast this with how the court applied this requirement in Elmboro Park. So in Elmboro Park, the court said that being able to use the park as a park, in other words, as a big communal backyard, actually is a utility and a benefit, and is not merely recreation and amusement. So the court says that yes, it's true that using a backyard is a pleasure, and in fact, the court says it's the purest pleasure that there is, is using your backyard. However, using your backyard, and then by extension, using the park as a backyard, also provides exercise, a place to rest, a place to take children, a place to push your stroller around. And that all of these activities are activities of utility and benefit, and not just recreation. Okay, so if you don't find that convincing, then again, the judicial values that are underlying this analysis about how land should be used and what land is good for, are just aren't values that resonate with you, right? So we can see that um, you know, the values of the English judiciary are very much at play in this decision. Okay, so that's it. Those are the four requirements. So if you have a fact pattern, and you're trying to determine whether something is an easement, before you can conclude that anything is an easement, you have to go through all of those requirements and determine whether they're met, okay? Okay, so this brings us to the next topic, which is positive and negative easements. So I'm actually doing this a little bit out of order from the way it's presented in the text, because I find it is helpful to uh, cover this up front. This is actually, I put the pages there at pages 689 to 91, just in case you're following along with the text. Okay, so we have positive easements and negative easements. Positive easements are all the easements we've been talking about so far. Okay, everything we've been talking about so far are examples of positive easements. These are the typical easements. So a positive easement occurs when the owner of the dominant tenement has the right to go onto the serving tenement or the right to use the Serbian tenement for some reason. And a key principle of positive easements is that there's no limitation on the type or kind of positive easement. Now the way that sometimes put is that the list of positive easements, the kinds of things that can be positive easements, that list is not closed. Okay, so we can contrast this with negative easements. 
So the effect of a negative easement is that it prevents the Serbian tenement owner from doing something with their land. Okay, as opposed to letting the dominant tenement owner go onto the Serbian land, it prevents the Serbian tenement owner from doing something with their land. Now, of course, there's a sense in which positive easements also have this effect, right? If the dominant tenement owner has the right to go on to the Serbian tenant, tenant to do something, there's going to be a corresponding way in which the Serbian tenement owner is limited to what they can do. But the way to remember it is that with a negative easement, the key significance is that the Serbian tenement owner is prevented from doing something, as opposed to the dominant tenement owner going onto the land. Okay, so the classic example here is a right to light. So if the dominant tenement has a right to light over a Serbian tenement, what that means is that it's not that the owner of the dominant tenement is going onto the Serbian tenement to get some light, right? They're not going onto land. Instead, it just means that the Serbian tenement can't build in such a way that it blocks the light, or they can't otherwise put up an obstruction that would block the light to the dominant tenement. So that illustrates how it's about preventing the Serbian tenement from doing something as opposed to going on to the Serbian tenement. Okay, so the key principle to take with respect to negative easements is that, whereas I said the list of positive easements is not closed, the list of negative easements is closed. There are only four negative easements that are recognized under the common law. So of course, Legislation can override the common law, legislation can create other negative easements, but under the common law, there's only these four. So there's a right to light, a right to air by a defined channel, a right to lateral support for buildings, lateral means from the side, so a right to be supported from the side of a building, and the right to continue to receive the flow of water from an artificial stream. Okay, so the authority for this is Phipps and Pears. So the, what was happening in Phipps and Pears is that we have uh, two buildings that are built up against each other. So number uh, 14 and number 16. Okay, so, um, Originally, they're owned by the same person, and um, the owner tears down number 16 and builds up number 16 again, so there's a new number 16, but it's built up against number 14 in such a way that number 14, like they're touching. And so the owner never does plaster over this side of number 16 because it's being protected by number 14, right? Because there, there's no separation between them. So it's not uh, plastered over and it's not protected uh, from the elements because the wall of 14 is, is what's protecting it. So it's not necessary to plaster it over. However, then eventually there's new owners of both of them. And number 16, like I said, is new. Number 14 is still old and there's an order for it to get demolished, right? So it's no longer inhabitable. So the owner of number 14 tears it down but that means then that this wall is left exposed. So now all of the rain gets into the wall of number 16, because it's not protected, it's not plastered over, and then it freezes and then it cracks, and now there's all these cracks in the wall, and so now there's all this damage. So number 16 is suing number 14 and saying that they have an easement to be protected from the weather by the wall of number 14. However, the court says, no, sorry, number 14, uh, sorry, sorry, number 16, you can't get that easement because there's only four negative easements known to law, and that's not one of them. Right? So this is, if this were an easement, it would have been a negative easement because it's not that number 16 is arguing that they should be able to go on to number 14. Instead, they're trying to prevent number 14 from doing something with their land. So the argument of number 16 is that, well, there is a negative easement to have lateral support from the side. And we're not asking for that, but it's not that we were using number 14 for support. 
we're asking for protection from the weather, but that's analogous, right? It's close enough to, it's similar enough to lateral support that it should also count as an easement. But uh, the court says, no, we've got this specific list, there's just four of them, that's not one of the four, and so therefore you don't get that easement. So there's no easement to be protected from the weather. Sorry, and then what, what do you get protected by on the third uh, easement, the negative easement, the right to allow more support for a building? Yes. Why the, uh, yeah, I could not understand why you could, this would not apply because it doesn't matter if it doesn't say from, where, from what you would be protected to support. So support means like support, right? It means like you're being held up. Yeah, so it can only really happen in there because there's still uh, a wrong, right? So it's not that 16 needs 14 to be held up, right? It's not that when 16 got torn down, this started falling over, that which is what support negative. means. That would be a negative thing. Exactly. So then if that was what was happening, then 16 could win. But in this case, because there was nothing there and then the weather was starting to interfere with the uh, so uh, number 16 would like to stop number 14 from demolishing at all. Yeah, exactly, yes. And if they do demolish, then ask them for compensation. But unfortunately, they lose. So one of the rationales that's given in fix and pairs and one of the rationales that's given generally as to why there's only four negative easements and there can't be any more is because if we had more negative easements, and if negative easements were more common, then they would unduly restrict the development of land, mm -hmm. right? So negative easements hamper legitimate development of land and being able to put land to its best use. So the way that Denning puts this in Fixed and Pairs is he says that, uh, suppose that we give this easement to number 16, then for number 14 would be forced to have this dilapidated old building standing there forever even though it's condemned and he can't use it because 16 has this right to be protected from the weather and so that's preventing legitimate development you know where number 14 wants to actually build up uh, something better right and not be stuck with some dilapidated old building so that's the rationale we can question whether that's really persuasive, though, because, of course, it's not the case that if this was an easement, number 14 would be forced to leave the dilapidated building there. They could tear it down. They would just be forced to pay to protect this wall, right? They would just be forced to have it plastered over before any weather gets in, or if weather does get in, then they pay for the damages. So we can um, question how persuasive that rationale is. Okay, so in terms of distinguishing between positive and negative easements, uh, this is just a summary that summarizes the principles that I've said so far. So I'll let you look at that on your own. But, so here's some examples. So suppose there's a claimed right to tunnel under land. Is that positive or negative? Positive. Positive, yeah, exactly. Um, suppose there's a right to maintain power lines and towers over someone else's land. Positive or negative? Positive. Yeah. So it's a right to maintain power lines and towers over their land, right? So it's a right to do something on their land. Okay. But in this case, wouldn't be um, the dominant over we go in with the maintenance, that's why I thought it was negative because it would be the servant who would go and Yeah, and require to spend some money. Okay, so let's say there's uh, the dominant tenement and the servient tenement. And there's a, the dominant tenement has a power line, but in order to connect to the generator, it has to go over the servient tenement's land. Right? So it's positive because they're doing something on the servient tenement. Yeah, the main thing though, because, um, so every time you have an easement, there is uh, something that the other part needs to do. There's a burden, an obligation. So in this case, the servant then, so first of all, needs to let the, the wire go in, but then at the same time, he, he cannot destroy it, he cannot um, do something, he cannot hang anything on it, you know what I mean? Would, would that yep. also be? So, so like I said, every positive easement also has some aspect of preventing the servant tenant from using the land in some way, right? So 
that's only part of the explanation as to what makes something a negative easement. To understand the negative easement is that that's all that's happening. Right? So in a negative easement, the dominant tenement owner isn't also going on to the land and doing something. It's that the only significance is that the servant tenement owner is prevented from doing something on their land. So it's always benefiting the dominant tenement owner. Uh, so by definition, the dominant tenement always has a benefit. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so what about a right to a view? So suppose you claim you have a right to a view. Negative. Negative. And it, and it couldn't be an easement, right? Yes. Okay. It's not one of the four. What about if you have a right to have drainage pipes and sewers underground on someone else's land? Positive. Positive. Uh, excuse me. Yeah. Uh, can you say again about the right to a view? It's a negative easement? Yes. Yeah. So let's say that you are, um, so here we have a dominant tenement and a servient tenement. And the dominant tenement has this, well, okay, so this, this is, they have a house and they have a window right here, and suppose they claim they have a right to a view because there's a beautiful ocean over here. So if they do have a right to a view, what that means is that the servant tenement can't build anything or put anything up that would obstruct that view. So it's preventing the servant tenement from doing something with their land, but it's not that the dominant tenement is going on to the land and doing anything. But so it's, it so should have been created by legislation, right? It's not one of the four. Right, exactly. I said that if it were, it would be negative, but it's not one of the four. Oh. That's right. Yeah, it's a claimed easement. It's a claimed right. The four was created by legislation, sorry? The four are by legislation or common law? No, no, the four are common law. Common law. And then legislation would have one. If you put some yes, exactly. So you see in power would have one, I guess, but nobody could build a higher building than the CN power? That, yeah, that could potentially be a, possi a possibility created by legislation, because legislation can override the common law. Okay, so what if you have a right to a closed line? Positive or negative? Positive. Positive, right? So it's a closed line over someone else's land. What if you have a right to use a church pew? So if there's a certain pew in the church, and that's yours, you have a right to use that church pew. Positive. So these examples of, come from cases. Those cases where people are claiming these rights. So what if you have a windmill and you're claiming to have a right to have the wind blow on your windmill? In other words, you're claiming that your neighbor can't do anything to prevent the wind from blowing on your windmill. Negative, exactly. But it doesn't exist, right? So there's a right to air by a defined channel. So a defined channel is like a duct. But Wind is not a defined channel. Wind is just undefined. It's just you know blowing undefined. So this would be one of the four. One needs uh, right to prevent building too close to a public line. Yep. So that one. Oh, I thought. I, oh, I missed it. Sorry. Yeah, you oh, missed it. Sorry. Right. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So a right to prevent building too close to a property line. Is that positive or negative? Negative. 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 Exactly. So it's just stopping your neighbor from doing that. Mm -hmm. And then uh, right to a closed line, we did that. Yeah, yeah. Washroom. 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 yeah, so a right to use your neighbor's washroom. Suppose you have some right to use their washroom. Positive. Exactly, it means going on to their land. Uh, a right to shade from your neighbor's tree. Negative. Negative, Negative. Negative right? Because you're not actually, it's a shade that comes onto your property, is the example. So you're not going onto their land, you're just on your property, but claiming that they can't do anything to that tree that would prevent the shade. Um, from uh, protecting you on your property. Okay. So the common law recognizes a negative easement for, um, for the possibility of light and also for air by defined channel. However, we have legislative limitations. So specifically, Section 33 of Real Property Limitations Act says that there can't be an easement to light or air that arises through prescription. We haven't talked about prescription yet, but it's the equivalent to adverse possession, right? So it's an easement that arises through long use. So here the restriction is that you can't get an easement through long use for air or for light. So this is an issue then for people who put up solar panels, right? So if you put solar panels on your roof, 
you're going to want to get an express easement with your neighbors to say that you're going to continue to have the right to sign. You don't want to just rely on chance or hope that through long use you can get the easement because Section 33 prevents the possibility of getting that easement through prescription. Yeah, so let's say that you put solar panels on your roof and you want to be able to get light on your solar panels forever going forward, right? Because you've got this fit contract, or at least you did if you did this like 10 years ago. Mm -hmm. uh, you, can't, you don't want to just rely on chance because, you know, you don't just get an easement because you need it, right? So you want to get express agreement with your neighbor that they're not going to build in a way that blocks the light. And you also can't just hope to rely on long use or another's prescription because this provision prevents that. You don't get a right to light by virtue of prescription in Ontario. Mr. Johnson? So, in this circumstance then, what if it was like a new build, for instance, like a new house, they got the solar panels, and then, you know, new builders, they also plant trees and such that <coughs> over the next 20 to 25 years or so, those trees will hit a certain point. If you're going through this agreement to try and ensure that that shade is not going to be blocking the uh, potential for any type of light. How is that to be established from a tree that's just going to continue to grow up higher? Yeah, exactly. So you want to get an express agreement. So, what, cut it down? Or? Yeah, exactly. So you get yeah. an express agreement saying that um, either they're not going to plant trees or, or if the trees do high. grow that high, they have to trim them, or if they can't trim them, they have to cut them down. Exactly. Um, so it's, it's the same thing that we've talked about so far, that under the Registry Act, it's not a requirement. You could, but you don't have to. Under land titles, yes, everything must be registered under land titles. Mm -hmm. And so when we talk about prescription, we're also going to see that prescriptive easements aren't possible if your land is under the Land Titles Act. Yeah. If you get that easement by the contract, would it be a commandment to set up the easement on title? Sorry, uh, if you get um, like agreements from the neighbors to not to plant trees or cut down the trees, would it not be a covenant on the title instead of an easement? Yes. No, a covenant. A covenant. A covenant. Okay, yes, yeah, so we're going to talk about covenants as well. Yeah, and so we're going to see that covenants and easements overlap in many ways, but there's also specific differences. And they can both be created expressly, and so... By an agreement? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah. So, if it's for a negative uh, easement, if it's not one of the four of common law, and, and if it's not a provision under legislation, there's no way to win, right? To get the right. Right, yes. Yeah. Okay, so we've been sort of talking around this, but now let's talk about the creation of easements. So, how do easements come about? How do they get created? So it's not the case that anyone who wants an easement gets one, right? Or it's, and it's also not the case that just because you've let someone use their, your land in a way once, that somehow they get an easement to do that. There are specific rules about uh, how and when easements get created. Okay, so before we talk about those, we need to understand some terminology. So first we need to understand the difference between a grant of an easement and a reservation of an easement. Okay, so first just look at the one on the left that is an indication of a grant. Okay, just look at that one first. So suppose that A starts by owning this entire parcel, then A divides it in half and sells the north half to B, but keeps the south half for himself, and the road only goes across the south half. So if B is going to be able to get in the parcel, B is going to need a right of way over A's land. Right, that's the example we've talked about already. <coughs> So in this example, this is an instance of a grant. So A is not only selling the north half to B, but also granting the easement out of what A has retained for himself. So A is giving something extra, granting something extra to B. So we can contrast this with the one on the right, which is a reservation. So here, it starts the same. A starts with the whole parcel. However, what A retains for himself is the north half, and what he decides to sell is the south half. But here, of course, the road only goes across the south half, so when A does this, he's going to want to keep a right-of-way for himself over what he sells to B. 
So when it works this way, the right-of-way is referred to as a reservation. A had to reserve the easement out of what he sold to B. He had to hold something back, keep something back for himself, or in other words, reserve it for himself. So it's a reservation. Okay, so first we'll talk about express grants and express reservations. So these are easy. So this is when the parties expressly create uh, a grant of an easement or a reservation of an easement. So this can happen by agreement. So the parties uh, agree together in a contract, for instance. But it can also happen through statute. Right? So statutes can expressly create uh, grants of easements and reservations of easements. Okay, the more difficult way in which easements can arise is by implication. So this is the second way, and then we're going to see the last way is by prescription, in other words, through long use. So by implication means that when there is no express creation of an easement, in some cases, the law will imply an easement. Or in other words, easements will arise by implication of law. So the first key requirement that has to be in place for an easement to arise by implication is that the parcel must start out as being owned by one person. Okay, so that applies, we're gonna see that there's two rules and then four exceptions. In all of these, in the two rules and the four exceptions, this requirement applies to all of them. In all cases, you start with a parcel that's owned by one person and then it gets divided. So there's two ways in which the parcel can get divided. It can get physically divided, which is what we've been talking about so far, right? So all these examples where A owns the land to begin with and then divides it and sells one half to B. So that's just physically dividing the land. There's a second way in which the parcel can get divided, and that's when the freehold estate gets divided from the leasehold estate. In other words, when you lease out some or all of the land. In other words, there can be an easement between the landlord and the tenant. So this is actually an exception to the uh, rule from Ellenborough Park, the third rule that says that the owner of the dominant tenement and the owner of the serving tenement have to be different people. Because in this example, the landlord can actually be the owner of both the dominant tenement and the serving tenement. However, the reason why there can still be an easement is because there's two different estates. Right, so the landlord holds the freehold estate, but the tenant holds the leasehold estate. And so the easement is actually between the estates. There's an easement between the freehold estate and the leasehold estate. We're going to see examples of how that works. Okay, so like I said, there's two rules. And uh, the first rule applies to grants. Right? So that's why we have to know the difference between a grant and a reservation. Rule number one only applies to grants. So both of these rules we're going to see come from a more general principle, which is that a grantor, someone who grants their land, someone who conveys their land, is not permitted to derogate from their grant. Okay, so rule number one comes from Wilden and Burroughs, and the statement of this rule is at the top of the second page of the uh, document by Professor Phillips. And what this rule says is that when we have a parcel of land that starts by being owned by one person, but it gets divided, then all of the continuous and apparent quasi-easements that the owner was already using on the uh, serving tenement that are necessary for the reasonable enjoyment of the land will then count as easements. Okay, so what does all of that mean? So first, the term quasi-easement. So as the excerpt from Professor Phillips explains, the reason why it refers to quasi-easements there is because we're talking about land that's initially owned by one person. And one person can't have an easement over their own land, as we were just talking about. So it's referring to all of the things that would be easements if the land wasn't owned by one person. Okay, so for example, the way this works is suppose that 
this regular example that we've been using so far. So suppose that A starts by owning this whole piece of land and then A sells this part to B. And suppose that before A sells to B, there already is this road here, right? So before A sold to B, A was already using this road to get to this parcel when A owned it. This road would be a quasi-easement, right? It, it would have been an easement if not for the fact that A owns both parcels. Also, it counts as being continuous and apparent, right? Those are the other requirements. So here, continuous and apparent just refers to the fact that the claim easement has to have a physical existence, right? So continuous meaning continuing in time, right? So a continuing physical existence. And apparent just means that it is observable. So something that you can see if you look for it. So another way that sometimes put is that it's discoverable by someone who's reasonably conversant with the land. Okay, so the way that this illustrates the principle of a grantor cannot derogate from their grant is that basically what this means is what you see is what you get. So if it looks like you need an easement or you should have an easement in order to get to the north part and there's a, something there that would count as an easement, then you get the easement, right? It's uh, continuous and apparent. Okay, so rule number two applies to reservations, right? So rule number one, I said applies to grants. Rule number two applies to reservations. And it also comes from Wilden Burroughs, and this is at the top of page two of the handout. Basically, what rule number two says is that there are no implied reservations. Okay, so rule number two is just a general prohibition against reservations arising through implication. Okay, so rule number two basically just says that a reservation of an easement doesn't arise through implication. That being said, now we're going to look at the exceptions. There's four exceptions, and some of them do apply to implied reservations. Okay, so it is possible for there to be an implied reservation if it meets one of the exceptions. But rule number two is a general rule against implied reservations. Okay, so um, next we have Wilden Burroughs. I think we'll just skip through this one. Essentially, it's just the authority for saying that there can't be implied reservations. Basically, it's just an instance of a claimed reservation that arises by implication, and the court just says no, because we have general rule number two, which says easements that are reservations cannot arise through implication. Okay, so let's go through the exceptions. So the first exception is ways of necessity. And here this exception applies to both grants and reservations. So what this refers to is land that would otherwise be landlocked. Okay, so you can have a way of necessity that arises by implication if the land would be landlocked, if not for this easement. Now it's important to note though that this principle doesn't mean that everyone who has landlocked land automatically gets an easement over someone else's land just because you went and bought landlocked land. Okay, so after this class, just because you saw this principle, don't go and buy some landlocked land and then claim to have easements over the land surrounding you. Remember that all of these principles that we're looking at on the screen only apply when the land is initially owned by one person and gets divided, right? So if you just go buy some land that doesn't fall in that situation, you can't just you walk up to your neighbor and like demand an easement of necessity to go across their land. Okay, so the principle for that is McClatchy and Rideau Lakes. So that's a principle that says that this doesn't apply everywhere. It applies specifically when land is initially owned by one person and then gets divided. Okay, so we can ask ourselves, what's the difference between ways of necessity and rule number one? 
right? So rule number one gave us this easement here. But how does this differ from ways of necessity? Okay, so the key difference is that suppose that in this example, there's actually another road. And the other road, though, is like a dirt road, and it's also very long and windy, and it's very inconvenient, and it only hooks up with the main road um, after going through you know, a whole bunch of really inconvenient twists and turns. Okay, so now, under rule number one, B would still get this easement. Right, because rule number one just says whatever is continuous and apparent quasi easement you get, even though this other uh, less convenient road exists. However, for ways of necessity, under ways of necessity, B does not get this easement. Right, that B can still have it because of rule number one, but B cannot have it because of ways of necessity. So, ways of necessity means that the land is actually landlocked. Here, if there's another road, even if it's less convenient, it's not actually landlocked, so you won't get it through ways of necessity. So the significance of that is, suppose that when A divides this land, that the road wasn't there. So then, B cannot get it through rule number one, right? It wasn't there to begin with. And B also, when this other road is there, can't get it through ways of necessity. So then B is stuck just using this other convenient road or making another deal with A and paying for an easement um, through an express agreement with A. So if you mentioned ways of necessity means what? So it's an easement that allows you to access land that would otherwise be landlocked. Thank you. Okay, so yeah. Alas, it was in existence, in existence before the, the, the severance of the land, then because he saw it, so he knew that this is implied uh, easement. Yes. Uh, yeah. <coughs> okay. Um, okay. What about if the land is not accessible, uh, you don't have access to a roadway, but the only access is via water. Then is the ways of necessity still available? Can you still rely on ways of necessity if your only access to the land is by means of water? So here we have the Dobson and Todd decision. And here we have cottage properties and they are completely inaccessible except for a small portion that butts onto a river. And here the court says that the owners of the cottage are entitled to an easement of necessity, right? So 
part of the example or part of the um, facts is that initially it's the one owner who buys the property, right? So remember that that's always part of the requirement. So here the water doesn't thereby make it accessible. You still get these weapons that peak even if there's access by water. So then we have the Myrtle and Earth's decision. It's similar facts, um, but they spell out more guidance as to how accessible or inaccessible water access will be, um, how the court will consider water access to be accessible or inaccessible. And they give a number of factors. So specifically they say that water access is not considered to be the same as access over land, especially if you don't have a right of access through the water. Right? So it might be that some lake doesn't allow you to go across it, you just don't have a right to cross the lake. So then obviously that's not going to be helpful. Or it might be that you do have access um, across the water, you are entitled to cross the water to get to your land, but it's not available for transportation of things that are needed in order to access the land. So in this case, in Hurdle and Ernst, they wanted, right now the land was vacant, and they wanted to build a cottage on it. But in order to do that, you're going to have to transport like a ton of, not just materials, but like building equipment, right? And being able to do that over water was just not actually logistically feasible. Uh, so the other factor is that the water access doesn't actually have transportation facilities. So suppose that um, there's actually no docking facility, right? So even if you could, even if you do have a right to cross it and you can get the things there, if there's no way to actually get them from, you know, your barge onto the land, then that's also not going to help you. Um, and then the fourth point is that the water is not uh, usable as, uh, as commerce or travel. Okay, so then this applies to Jangle and Keach. So remember we were talking about that one as well. Okay, so sorry. Oh no, it's still here. So C could potentially argue for a way of necessity, but as we said when we were talking about it, it would only be applicable if the parcel had started out as being all owned by the same person that it gets divided. Right? If that's not the case, then this isn't available as an argument for C. So in the exam, for example, in a situation like the C situation, should we spell it out as an option but actually acknowledge that it's not an option? Or should we just focus on what's available? Okay, yeah, that's a great question. So the possibility is triggered by the facts, right? Because it's a situation where C is landlocked. C doesn't have access to his land from land. So you should at least say why it's not available. Right, if it's if in the fact pattern it doesn't start as being held by one person and get divided, then you should at least say that ways of necessity is not available here because the land wasn't initially held by one person and then got divided. Mm -hmm. But you don't have to. Um, but you don't have to then, for instance, go through all the other possible rules and exceptions if they're not triggered by the facts. For instance, the next one we're going to look at is. Um, Mutual easement, right? So if it's not a mutual easement, don't bother talking about that one. Okay. Uh, okay. So mutual easement. This applies to reservations. So this is an exception uh, to rule number two specifically. So what it says is that there can be an implied reservation of an easement if it's a mutual easement. So here the case that's given in the materials is Pyre and Carter. So here, what was happening is so we have two houses. So one is owned by the defendant and one is owned by the plaintiff. And here's the property line that divides them. So the defendant's house has a faucet coming off of it and water comes out of it. And it goes across onto the plaintiff's property line. So the defendant is releasing water onto the plaintiff's property. However, right underneath there is a drain. And so the drain on the plaintiff's property then drains away, but it goes across the defendant's property. Okay, so the reason why there's a problem is because then the drain gets obstructed 
on the defendant's property. And so now it gets backed up, and so then now there's a big flood flooding the plaintiff's property. So the plaintiff complains and says, I have an easement for this drain to go across your property, and so you have to unblock it so that it stops the flood. And the defendant doesn't want to be responsible for it. However, the court says that there is an easement here because if the defendant wants to take advantage of having the easement to release the water onto the plaintiff's property to begin with, then they have to be subject to the mutual easement of allowing the drain to go across their property. Okay, so the reason why this one is an issue is because the properties do start out as being owned by the same person. Right, so we have the original owner who initially owns both of the properties. Then the owner sells to the defendant first. Then after that, they sell to the plaintiff. So because they sell to the defendant first. So we have the, initially it's the defendant here and the original owner here. So if the original owner wants to claim to have this as an easement, it would have to be a reservation, right? They would have to be holding something back, reserving something out of what they sold to the defendant. Rule number two says there's no implied reservations, but then we have this exception of a mutual easement where you can have an implied reservation when the other person is trying to rely on a correspondingly mutual easement. Okay, so does that make sense? Okay. So no, like, again? Okay. So if the right to have this pipe run across the defendant's property is an easement, it would have to be an applied reservation. Does that is that part clear as to why that is? Yeah, okay. Because it is sold specifically to the defendant first. Okay. So rule number two says that there are no implied reservations unless there's an exception. So here, exception number two applies to mutual easements. It says that you can have an implied reservation if it's in the context of a mutual easement. And this is a mutual easement because the defendant wants the easement to be able to let this water out onto the plaintiff's property, right? This water is coming onto the plaintiff's property. But if the defendant wants that easement, then they have to submit to the corresponding mutual easement of letting the water drain out onto their own property. I have a question about the intention between the new one. Okay. So maybe under new one because the, the initial owner wants to sell the property to the family first. So the under new one, the defendant already has an easement to release water to the But I mean, then you buy new two, then you sell it. The uh, defendant's existing is is they is good using it to some conditions. Is, is okay. So yeah, the defendant um, can claim uh, this easement under rule number one because this part is a right, and it presumably it already existed and it's continuous on current. Okay, <coughs> but it's it's this one here that is the subject of the decision. So you, but you can't get this easement through rule number one because rule number one only applies to grants. But that one's a reservation. I mean, from the defendant's perspective, why the defendant should need to give something if he really has under the rule one? Oh, okay. So the defendant, yeah. Why should the defendant have to submit to this one because? Um, like, why should that be a rationale? Or why should this be a rationale? Because the defense are already entitled to this. Because it's a mutual easement, basically. Just because the law says it's mutual. Actually, the mutual easement may be trump. The grant in the new one. If the condition has to be fulfilled. I mean, I don't know if I would say it trumps it, because it exists. Like, you get, the defendant does get that easement under both of them, right? So. Um, like there's no such in which the defendant doesn't get the easement. Um, but I mean, like it's a fair point. It's a it's a fair question. But the answer is just because it's a mutual easement, right? Because they're they're affecting each other and they're dependent on each other. Yeah. Okay. Um, any other questions about uh, 
is Will's exception so far. Just one quick question. So, because at first I thought it would be very rare that one owner splits the land, but actually it happens to all the builders, like giving out the land. As long as they build the house that way, everything will apply to them. Yeah, exactly. So it's actually not that rare, right? So builders will uh, like acquire a huge piece of land and then and build so subdivisions, basically, and um, like build uh, houses and um, and divide them out. So it's 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 not that rare. Yeah, good 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 point. Yeah. Um, No, so so you, you do the diagrams yourself on the exams. So you have to provide them. no, you don't have to provide them. But my, my one of my exam tips, and I'll go through some exam tips mm -hmm. on Thursday, is to make diagrams for yourself, right? Just to help you understand it. So I won't mark your exams. It's not a part of your answer. It's not a requirement. Sorry, I won't mark your diagrams. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I'm getting tired. It's three hours. So I won't mark your diagrams, it's not required, it's not part of your answer, but I, I highly recommend doing it for yourself in order to make sure that you understand what the question is saying. Okay, so um, let's stop there and we'll pick up here tonight and then, or sorry, on Thursday. <laughs> <laughs> okay, yeah, time to stop. Last one, This month is an exam question. Julie, Julie, I'm